All right. Everyone hear me all right? All right. Well, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you made it through some pretty bad weather today. Uh, you know, we had a string of, of good weather there for a while, and, uh, and then the latest round of uh, uh, Mueller indictments came out, and I think that had an effect on it. I think they're uh, uh, inextricably uh, connected. So uh, I, I want to thank all you for coming today. My name is Ben Frijan. Uh, I'm the chancellor of the uh, Politics Society here. Uh, I got the chance to study at Oxford this summer uh, on a Wilson grant. Uh, and I, you know, one of the many great things that I took back from it was the Oxford Union. Uh, and so we got the idea this year, uh, uh, Philip Scholler and I, who's in my uh, class, to start our own uh, political union. And uh, so the MBA Politics Society was born, and uh, MBA has a lot of great traditions, and I hope this is uh, uh, one of the ones that uh, hangs around. So uh, our very first official guest, uh, Congressman Jim Cooper. Thank you. I didn't know I was your inaugural guest. <laughs> I feel especially important. That There's way. a lot of pressure on you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I'll try not to mess it up. <sighs> All right. So I, I want to start at the very beginning. So you went to uh, Groton, uh, very similar to MBA. Uh, and your dad was a politician. He was governor. So do you feel like you were sort of born into this, or when did you get into politics? Well, politics should not be hereditary, but I did have a head start because my father, who was much older than my mom, uh, of course, was a successful politician in his own right, and he always included us, for example, in all the meals, all the discussions. There was no kids' table in our house. So we were expected to read the newspaper, to watch TV, to know what was going on, and to fully participate in all the discussions. And back then, the Vietnam War was going on, so it was very real. You saw it on TV and you knew that when you turned 18 you could be drafted to go fight in the jungle. So this was not some theoretical enterprise here. You knew that um, the country had to make wise decisions. So you, uh, I, I don't know if you knew him well or anything, but uh, Jason Chavetz was uh, uh, the guy from Utah. And he hated Congress so much that he quit in the, mi in the middle of his term last summer. He, he was like, I'm done with this. Uh, so, c can you tell me what it's like to be a congressman? What, what's your daily routine? You know, do you like it? Well, first in your preamble. Do you want to quit or anything? <laughs> you know? um, first in the preamble, his name is Jason Chaffetz. That's Chaffetz. the way he pronounces yeah. it. He is from Utah. He uh, did quit Congress, but many people quit Congress. Um, a record number, I think, of 35 Republicans have already quit this year, including some committee chairmen including the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And they have various reasons for quitting. Oftentimes, they cite their uh, dislike of Congress. But it's a little bit ironic that these folks have served in Congress for so long and then suddenly developed a dislike, in fact, a passionate dislike. Uh, oftentimes, they have ulterior motives. A favorite one is to quit Congress, look superior, and then go back and run for another office. Um, I don't want to be too cynical about their motives, and I won't speak directly to Jason, but uh, Congress has always been held in low repute, including at the founding. Um, Congress could certainly improve its activities. Um, it is at a modern low point today, uh, and it could be improved with some relatively simple reforms. But to me, giving up on the process is the last thing you should do. Sadly, I think the better people are more likely to quit. Uh, and the less uh, good people are more likely to stay. So we don't want that continual attrition or brain drain of the better people. Um, some people have described Congress as a sausage factory. Any legislative body could be described that way. You take bits and pieces, odds and ends, you combine it in one sausage casing and you hope it tastes good. And sausage tastes pretty good. But you don't want to ask about which part of the pig you're eating. Um, the phrase has been, they use all parts of the pig except the squeal. So that would include the brain, the bristle, the bone, lots of things that aren't very appealing to think about. Now, Congress should be a superior body that votes individually on separate issues, so there's full accountability for the Congress people, so that you know how we stand on issues. But often there's log rolling. They put everything in one big package or one big sausage, and you just hope the good outweighs the bad. 
Yeah, that, that makes me think, uh, uh, I think it was Ronald Reagan that said there's no smart people in government because if they were there, business would have picked them up by then. Well, uh, you put your finger on an important trend. Many of my colleagues now run for Congress only as a stepping stone so that they can be a lobbyist. Yeah, the, the pipeline, yeah. usually pays several times more than a congressman makes. And really, you as individual citizens should realize you have two governments today. You have the elected government that's set by the Constitution, and then there's a private government that outnumbers us 30 to 1, sometimes 60 to 1, of professional paid lobbyists. And I'm not talking about the citizens who fly to Washington to lobby us or who come talk to me in your office in downtown Nashville. I'm talking about the paid professionals who make a fortune representing a single special interest. And usually that's the government that you prefer because they can tell you, if you belong to that interest, exactly what you want to hear. Of course you deserve more tax breaks. Of course you deserve more government subsidy programs. Of course government should bend to your will. When elected officials, at least in the modern internet age, when you can catch us out if we contradict ourselves, we kind of have to tell you something that more likely resembles the truth. We can't just tell you what, for example, realtors want to hear, or bankers want to hear, or car dealers want to hear, or you know, tree huggers want to hear. We have to uh, give a little bit broader accounting of what's going on. So who, uh, who, are, your favor who, who are your best friends in Congress? Well, I have friends on both sides of the aisle because I'm what's called a blue dog Democrat. Mm -hmm. I um, try to look at the quality of the idea, not the authorship of the idea. Uh, I think political parties, you know, we're certainly scorned by the founders. They call them factions. Uh, political parties are um, a convenience. They're not a, a mandate to vote a certain way. Um, two of my best friends would be one, uh, Jim Himes from Connecticut. He's a fellow Rhodes Scholar, represents Greenwich, Connecticut. Ron Kine from, Minnesota, uh, from Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, both outstanding um, members of Congress. But Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, has always been one of my good friends. He's a very thoughtful, really? capable Republican. I think that having been nominated as Vice President, uh, that hurt him. Uh, and the Speakership has really hurt him because he did not seek that job. He is in charge of a nearly uncontrollable group of folks many of whom have never voted for anything in their entire lives, and they're not ready to start now. And you have to be for things in life. You can't just oppose. Um, one of my favorite phrases is any a mule or elephant can kick a barn down. It takes a carpenter to build one. And I've always tried to be in the carpentry business. How do you feel uh, that you've changed since, this is your, your 24th year, is that right? Mm -hmm. how, how, how do you feel that you've changed since first entering Congress, you know, not on necessarily on policy, but sort of your outlook of the country? Well, I'm older, hopefully I'm wiser, <laughs> and I'm definitely balder, we know that. <laughs> um, most people who are honest would tell you that you have to be there for a while before you really understand what's going on, because it's a relatively complicated institution. And the issues are unbelievably complicated. Like my specific congressional responsibility are two things, nuclear weapons and satellites. Both are zero tolerance for error uh, duties. Both of which America has a surpassing lead over all other nations. Both of which are horribly expensive and both of which are unbelievably technical. But who's gonna do it? Now, Certainly the executive agencies uh, take the lead. Congress is just like a board of directors. But we have this awkward responsibility. Can you think of any company in the world, or in the history of the world, that has two boards of directors for the same enterprise? And that's our House and Senate. And see, often they are at odds. Now this is the structure that our founders gave us, and it's the best structure in the world, but it has its own management problems. So, Part of our job is dealing with the other body, the Senate. And sometimes we call the Senate the nursing home because they're even older than we are. <laughs> and they're wiser in the sense that they have to represent a whole state, not a district. But uh, some senators, it's well known, are um, quite, um, quite senile. And yet the voters of their state keep on reelecting them. Um, and the voters can do what they want, and oftentimes it's quality of staff that really makes a difference, because oftentimes the member is actually the figurehead. 
But Strom Thurmond was there for a good 10 years when the people of South Carolina really knew they were relying entirely on his staff. Uh, so I want to move now more towards policy questions. So uh, we're in the midst right now of some of the most polarizing times in American history, Pro probably the most polarizing time uh, other than the Civil War, lead up to the Civil War. And I think you're a real rare breed because you're, you're a, a moderate. You know, if you ranked everybody in Congress 1 to 435, I think you'd be 218. So do, w would you agree with that, and do you feel like you represent the majority of Americans? Well, what I am is really a nerd. I try to study the bills and know what I'm voting on, and that usually means that my party, the Democratic Party, is right a lot of the time, but not all the time. Um, there's never been a political party or an individual that was perfect and right all the time, so I try to call them as I see them. Um, the phrase in politics is that there are only two things in the middle of the road, yellow lines and dead possums. And now in Middle Tennessee, we're getting some armadillos up here, so you probably have to add them to the <laughs> possum list. I saw one not long ago near Brentwood. I thought, this is a shocking migration from Texas and places like that. But if you don't have pride of authorship, if you try to look at the quality of the idea, it, ideas, good ideas sometimes come from strange places. One of the things I try to do in meeting with constituents back here in Tennessee is to find the good ideas and take them to Washington. And Tennesseans have come up with some remarkable things. Uh, we have carved out our own solutions to particular problems that are really um, national and trend setting. Now, oftentimes these ideas don't get a lot of attention. Uh, for example, in medical malpractice, we have an insurance company here that's owned by our physicians, and they do a marvelous job of policing uh, medical activity. We have a unique type of insurance company here in Tennessee for health insurance, and it's not even officially an insurance company. It's really run by the Farm Bureau, and it's helped a lot of self-employed and independent people since 1947 without any government regulation whatsoever. It's basically run on the honor system. As far as I can tell, it's been amazingly well run. Well, that's kind of an inspiring example. That's kind of like government by Eagle Scout or something. Like, that's pretty awesome. I love that. And see, that spirit of fairness that so many people in Tennessee have means that I can do things that none of my colleagues in Washington would dare do. I give everybody my cell phone number. I'll give it to you right now. It's 615-714-1719. And if there are any doubters in the crowd, you can check it right that, now. That's see. how I contacted him, well, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> and this is amazing because of 700,000 constituents. No one's ever called me late at night. No obscene phone calls. Now, y'all could be the first, but <laughs> Brad Joya would be on your case, but that would be ungentlemanly behavior on the part of MBA students. But I give it out to, like, everybody. And if you want trust, you have to be trustworthy, and you have to trust other people. It's a two-way street, and most of life should be run by the golden rule. Now, that's a little idealistic, but in general, it works far more than people think. But my colleagues say, especially from New York or California, they say, oh, people would call drunk from a bar at 2 o'clock in the morning. Well. It never happened to me. So it, <laughs> sometimes good things happen. You can't be too cynical about life. You have to be ready for the positive, because oftentimes the positive happens. So uh, g going back to uh, polarization, you know, how do we alleviate partisanship in this country? Well, you can certainly blame the elected officials, because oftentimes they fight, and actually their staffs are more likely to fight, because uh, the member usually uh, is an extrovert, usually gets to know other members uh, informally in the gym or in the cloakroom. And we're human beings, so we're going to find areas of similarity uh, that are off camera that you don't know about. The main force for polarization actually comes from back home, because most of us are trained to reflect our constituencies. And if your constituency only watches one channel on TV, and it's called Fox, or if it's called MSNBC, you are going to think that the other party is the devil and your uh, colleagues are the devil. So uh, George Will, a conservative columnist, has pointed this out for many years. Congress may be too good a reflection of the people, not just in terms of polarization, but also in terms of um, um, mediocrity. Because um, politics has always been called the profession of C students. 
and now it might be D or F students, because we're actually getting people elected to Congress today who never even went to college. And this does not mean that they're bad people, but when it comes to understanding a complicated issue, or having a background in history, or economics, or things like that, uh, much less literature or broader liberal arts subjects like that, that's just simply lacking. Uh, and it's much more easier, much easier for folks like that to fall for propaganda than it is for somebody who's well-read and deeply knowledgeable and can spot a fake or a phony uh, much more easily. So you uh, are on the uh, Armed Forces uh, Select Committee? Is that, is that They call it Armed Services. Armed Services, armed house, services. Yeah. okay. And uh, you're, you're one of the strongest proponents of the military, not, not just in the Democratic Party, but in, in all of Congress. So why do you think, uh, you know, when we have so many other areas of government that are underfunded, and we have the most expensive military in the world, we spend the most than any other country, mo most of which are allies, you know, what, why do we need to give the Pentagon more? Well, you've asked the question in what I would characterize as a pretty biased way. Uh, we are spending a tremendous amount of money on our military. It's in excess of $600 billion a year. And that's, in absolute dollars, the highest it's ever been. But actually, as a percentage of government spending, it's one of the lowest percentages it's ever been. It's about 5%. When in past years, like even when, say, John F. Kennedy was president, it was closer to 40%. With the end of the Cold War, we let down our guard. And the fundamental point to understand about our military budget is this. We really do not have the luxury of setting that budget. We are responding to threats. And the threat environment has never been graver, because never before have individuals been more empowered to threaten our country. 9-11 happened because 15 people, mainly Saudis, hijacked three airliners and wreaked unbelievable devastation, not only on the Twin Towers, but also on the Pentagon. And they tried, with the downed airplane in Pennsylvania, to attack the US Capitol itself. Some of our enemies are very skilled at turning Western technology into mortal threats against our country. Even the Joint Chiefs of Staff have been hacked. Uh, hackers have occurred in all forms, and almost every institution that relies on uh, computers, which is every institution, is weaker than they expect, because the internet is very, very hackable. Bio threats are amazingly prevalent. Fortunately, we haven't had that. And Ebola, which was a natural threat, did not cross the border, but easy transportation makes these threats ever more present. We are seeing, very sadly, a resurgent Russia of Putin who relies on nationalism and belligerency to try to keep himself in power longer in that country. President Xi is showing shocking uh, tendencies to become like Chairman Mao, the most powerful leader since Mao, to again use nationalism to shore up his position and the position of the Communist Party in China. So I wish we had the luxury of setting the dial in the military budget. It would be great to be able to dial it down, as most of our European allies have done. They're not even spending 2% of their budgets on the military, even though the NATO commitment is at least 2% or more. Now, the Eastern European countries are, the newer members of NATO, countries like Poland, the three Baltic states, they are acutely aware of the Russian threat. So we, as the beacon of hope on the planet, we, as the only safeguard, really, for the free world, we have to be sufficiently strong, but not stupidly strong, not extravagantly strong, so that the Western world feels safe under our umbrella. Now, we could skimp. Uh, we could encourage all of our allies to develop their own nuclear arsenals, but that would just encourage more chance of proliferation. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes good things happen. And after 9-11, all the expert panels, every single one, the 9-11 Commission, all the think tanks, everything, said that within 10 years, we would face a nuclear terrorist threat within the borders of the United States. That did not happen, thanks to our law enforcement, thanks to our extraordinary intelligence efforts. And sometimes you see snippets of this on TV. I was just watching. Homeland, that TV show the other day, some of our satellite technology. It is 
staggeringly wonderful. And we need to keep it that way. Because our enemies will gradually try to catch up to us, but we always need to be a step ahead. Now, one thing we do need to worry about is the Pentagon is unauditable for 20 or 30 years. It's been criticized by the GAO as being the least accountable of all government agencies. That needs to change. We also need to worry about the defense contractor oligopoly and the revolving door that enables retired military. And by the way, you can retire from the military at age 38. That you can get your 20 year service in if you didn't go to college and you can still get your college through the military. That's kind of an amazing deal if then you gouge your former colleagues in the services by overcharging. We heard testimony just recently that the F-35 airplane, and this is from a top Pentagon official, the Deputy, the Deputy Secretary of Defense said that the F-35 is a completely unaffordable weapon system. But that now is the only new aircraft in our inventory. It's a fifth generation fighter. And we haven't even built the new bomber that we need and things like that because we are still flying B-52 bombers, most of which were built almost before I was born. These are 60 plus year old airplanes and they're very refurbished, but that is an astonishing thing to have as one of our nuclear triad weapon systems. We've got to keep strong. And in many ways, we've fallen down on the guard, even though with, with these large budgets. So look at it in real terms, and I think you'll be more satisfied with where U.S. is in the picture. In fact, some people are calling for higher defense budgets than what we've got. Yeah, so that you were talking about the Pentagon, that, that was sort of what I was alluding to. You know, I remember reading a, a Washington Post article about a year ago that uh, the Pentagon covered up, they, they lost, it, it was over $100 billion, you know, and, and then they covered it up. So what, you know, oh. if we need to increase military spending, where should it go? You know, should it go to the VA? Should it go to, you know, somewhere else oh. or to weapons or? Well, you raise a couple of interesting points there. First, I should point out that I think I'm the only person on our committee, which is the largest committee in Congress, 60 plus people. I think I'm the only person on the committee who does not have a military base in his district of any size and does not have a major defense contractor. So I think I'm the only unbiased person on the committee because shockingly, some of my colleagues believe they're really the mayor of their uh, military base or best friend of the defense contractor. So they have been willing to do things for either the base or the contractor that perhaps shouldn't be done. Now, when you ask this other question, where should we spend more money? Uh, it's no secret, uh, myself with my Republican colleague on the subcommittee for space and nuclear, we advocated uh, this last year the creation of an entirely new corps. This would be the first new corps in the military since the Marine Corps. Uh, this is a new, well, not the Marine Corps, since the Army Air Corps split off from the, uh, it would be the first new corps. The Marine Corps is, of course, one of the oldest services in the nation. But uh, the bottom line is we really can't trust our Air Force to take care of our space needs because almost all the generals who get promoted in the Air Force, like 30 out of 32, are former fighter pilots. They have a huge bias in favor of piloted aircraft, so much so that the Air Force was even uh, opposed to drones. They only wanted piloted aircraft, and now as we're actually halfway toward robot wars, we realize the importance of drones. Of course, no vehicle in space is piloted. It's all robots, it's all drones, and the Air Force, we think, has systematically discriminated against that and allowed other competing nations to catch up more than they should have been allowed to. So we've advocated the creation of a whole new Space Corps so that people would enlist, people would be promoted, and people would succeed on evaluating our space capabilities. That is not happening today. Most people in the space part of Air Force don't get promoted, and they know that, so they're having a harder time um, recruiting the best people. Uh, I want to move on to uh, the tragedy uh, that just happened in, in Florida recently. Uh, ha you know, gun control or not, or, or maybe a, a mix of gun control or something else, how do we make schools safer and, and stop this kind of thing from happening? Well, first, and maybe, again, I'm too much of a nerd, let's put this in perspective. School tragedies have been happening with shocking frequency 
for a, a terribly long time now. I was looking it up on the Wall Street Journal website the other day, and I'd forgotten that there had been a shooting at J.T. Moore Middle School in Nashville in 1994. We've already apparently here in Nashville forgotten about the theater shooting in Antioch. You know, it can and will strike closer to home because with 310 million weapons, uh, and there are plenty of mentally ill folks, and schools are relatively accessible, and so are shopping malls, so are theaters, so are most public places. Unless you're in a government facility in which at the U.S. Capitol, we're heavily guarded because we've been attacked on multiple times. So the answer to it, there are many bills out there. I'm co-sponsors of most of them. Um, no more gun show loophole because 40% of sales at gun shows don't take place inside where there are background checks. They take place out in the parking lot where there's really no background check whatsoever. Uh, certain types of weapons, military weapons, probably should not be allowed to be sold because these are not for hunting. These are really more for killing other human beings. Uh, there are a number of things like that, size of magazines, because oftentimes it's the interval and reloading that gives you a better chance to take down the assailant. But this is a heavily uh, emotional and heavily politicized issue. I would encourage people to focus on the gun issue. Let's do our best to solve it. But let's also focus on actually what are statistically much bigger killers, texting while driving, opioids, you know, other forms of addiction. It is amazing how we tend to echo and reflect what's been in the news. And I think if you have a more um, a focused agenda, you will see that young people and people of all ages face actually many different threats. You know, Life is not risk-free. The question is how you sensibly uh, control those risks. And right now, we have seen an upsurge in traffic fatalities, primarily due to texting, and the convenience is overwhelming. My phone now with the new software says you will see, receive no messages while driving. But we really need, and our young people especially, are uh, subject to that. But somehow, that's not viewed as a threat, even though it can pose mortal danger to you. Uh, so I, I want to go back with the, the talk about uh, uh, military and, and guns. Uh, you brought up uh, autonomous weapons, you know, drones and, and uh, all kinds of stuff that, that's taking the, the people out of warfare. And I, I think that's very interesting because I, I, I think, uh, you know, if we can save American lives, you know, we should do it. But do you fear at all that autonomous weapons like drones are going to prolong war or, or disillusion us to, to how terrible war is? You know, do, you, do you think it's going to make it easier to go to war? Uh, President Obama expanded our, our drone program and uh, with all his uh, airstrikes to a, a, a massive scale. Do you, do you think that has negative effects? Well, this reaches a fundamental question. If you have the technological capability to do something, does that make you more likely to do it, whatever it is? Um, an old-fashioned phrase for this is, you know, does your reach exceed your grasp? You know, this is um, something that we really need to focus on in all areas, because I think there is an increased likelihood you will use a capability if you have it. But also, you don't want to be caught defenseless without it. And, you know, our other nations on Earth, not only aren't they stupid, many of them have greater technical capability than we do. If you look at U.S. graduate schools, in many graduate schools, almost every single student is foreign born. You know, while we're majoring in fun stuff, you know, sports management, you know, sociology or whatever like that, they are doing the hardcore engineering and science-based subjects and then we kick them out of the country, having educated them. As the columnist Tom Friedman has said, we really should staple a green card on every PhD, because most of all of them want to stay here, and we kick them out. This is kind of an amazingly stupid policy that we have. So drones in particular, um, there are two schools of thought. They have been a distressingly easy way to kill foreign enemies. They do seem statistically to have less collateral damage than conventional attack. Um, 
But on the other hand, it's awfully easy to push a button at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada and take out a bad guy 7,000 miles around the world and not really care a whole lot if there were a few innocent civilians. There's an Australian anti-terrorist expert, David Kilcullen, who has written that he actually thinks the use of drones are counterproductive because the sound of mosquitoes high up in the air or the fear that there's a drone up there that you can't quite see, the all-watching eye breeds such resistance and hostility that we could be harvesting generations of terrorists who take a blood oath against us because we killed their grandfather or cousin or nephew or wife or child. Oftentimes with modern propaganda, you really don't know what happened. It could be an IED they were building in their own building that went off, but they're not going to blame themselves, they'll blame us. And since there are no fingerprints to these attacks, unless you're highly skilled technologically and have satellite access, you really don't know what happened if you're there on the ground. And there's so many conspiracy theories that still live that like 9-11 wasn't real. There's even a conspiracy theory that Parkland school shooting was not real. And these unbelievably articulate high school students that I think we should all admire, these are some brave kids, especially having survived the trauma, that they have the chutzpah to <laughs> lobby Tallahassee already. Like, that's amazing. But in this fake news era, some people are trying to impugn their credibility. So, it's a very complicated world, but we need to be aware not only of uh, the limits of technology, but our likelihood that it kind of forces us into an easy push-button decision. So I, I want to go to healthcare, which is one of your uh, specialty issues. Uh, you uh, support Obamacare. Uh, do, you, do you still believe in it now that we've seen a couple years of it uh, in place and with the, the new Republican government that's going to try to you know, basically strip it apart? We have to be in careful in this area because I teach it at Vanderbilt and I don't want to give you a semester long answer to a question. <laughs> but I did have an alternative to Obamacare that was completely bipartisan. It was called uh, Wyden Bennett. Unfortunately, it didn't win the day, but Obamacare is a good substitute for that. I also had, believe it or not, an alternative to Clinton Care, which was also completely bipartisan. That's my style because I think it was Jefferson who said, um, Great issues cannot be moved on slender majorities. If you're going to do something as personal, as important as health care, it's got to be bipartisan. Now, Obamacare should have been bipartisan. It was designed to be. For example, we'd given our Republican friends the whole malpractice package if they just wanted to use it so they could get credit for that, adding it to the bill. They ended up turning up their nose at that, so there's no malpractice reform in the bill. There were other things that we offered to them. We included the package for the Small Business Lobby, National Federation of Independent Business, the SHOP Act, we put that in the bill almost in its entirety, which had been completely supported by Republicans. We put in the individual mandate, which was actually a core Heritage Foundation idea, fundamentally Republican because it was all about individual responsibility, good principles like that. And then the other party did a 180 on us and disavowed any support for this responsibility idea. So there are a lot of machinations uh, in the process, but overall, um, we need more access to health care for our people. Uh, some of you in the audience, like Mary Falls, have been stalwart advocates for that. Because in the Declaration, you know, the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you really don't have a shot at that unless you have a shot at decent health care. Now, having said that, me being numerically oriented, statistically, we tend to wildly overvalue remedial health care, doctors and hospitals. The latest information from the New England Journal of Medicine is that for your health destiny, if you care about being healthy, 40% is your own behavior, 30% is your own genetics, 15% are socioeconomic conditions, 5% is environment, and that really only leaves about 10% for doctors and hospitals. But we focus all of our emotional energy on doctors and hospitals, even though, for example, your own behavior is four times more influential than that. But see, 
dieting, <laughs> you know, exercise. We know that, but we don't want to do that. Uh, I go to the Y in Green Hills. By February, the place is cleared out because the New Year's <laughs> resolutions have expired. Every health club in America would go out of business if every member showed up. So we've got to get more real about this because oftentimes we are our own worst enemies when it comes to health care, and we don't want to acknowledge that. So when it comes to getting Americans better health destinies, and we really need to work on this because we lag the developed world in living longer, living healthier. Uh, we live, lag with infant mortality. Uh, we've got to do better. And Nashville has a particular burden here because we fashion ourselves as a healthcare capital when our results here aren't any better than Paducah, Kentucky, or Boise, Idaho, or you name it in America. Well, why are we a healthcare capital if we're not getting the results? I, I love business, I love capitalism, and I think the best policy is to have aligned interest. And I want people to make a ton of money if they're keeping us healthier. But if they're not, maybe they're overpaid. So, so, so you brought up aligned interests, and you know the, the Republicans have made it clear that they're a non-starter. They're, they're not going to work with any, any sort of health care reform. So why, you know, why not just blow the whole thing up and start over, create a, a, a Medicare for all or an NHS type system? Because you, know, you, you talked about cost. It, 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 would, it would be a lot cheaper, right? Because you'd get rid of the administrative costs. The lowest administrative cost health care in the country is Medicare. It would cover everybody. And the, the quality would probably go up as people have access to, to outpatient services and they're not bankrupted. Every time they go to the doctor, they're going to be more willing for, uh, to go to preventive care. You know, what, why not just go to a single-payer system? Well, I love your idealism. Uh, I love your enthusiasm. Um, many of my friends on the left have advocated uh, single-payer health care. And I was willing to co-sponsor the bill because, you know, it's better than what we got now. But let's look at the downside of that. Because your government in Washington does not use real accounting, you do not know that Medicare alone is $30 trillion in the hole. So it looks okay right now on the surface because it's off budget. Now, this is really a monumental thing to think about because the total national debt since Andrew Jackson, our only president to pay off the debt, is $20 trillion. So how could one program be in worse shape than the entire nation since the 1830s because we don't count it. Um, so Medicare looks in better shape than it actually is. So to use that as a model would be great if we want the United States of America to go bankrupt faster. I don't think that's what people want. So I've explained this to the advocates of single payer who sometimes are not as versed on accounting as I am, and I'm not an accountant, I'm not a CPA, but I try to keep up with the numbers. The key principles are everybody in our country should have access to affordable health care. Uh, we should be able to control the cost of the overall system, and there are a variety of ways to do that. Certainly, there are many other countries that do it more efficiently than we do. We could learn from a number of them. There's an excellent book on this called The Healing of America. It's by a journalist, T.R. Reed. And he took a bum shoulder to about 11 countries around the world for treatment. And his findings are shocking because he paid the biggest bill by far in America and didn't get much help. The country he actually ended up liking the most, which was the cheapest, was India. But most of us would probably have a hard time stomaching that system. In between are all sorts of good alternatives. Uh, France, according to the UN, has about the highest rated healthcare system in the world. It's still pretty expensive, but only half our price. And there are many aspects of this we can go into if you want to find out the, the details. But you will see by doing these international studies that while we have a lot of brilliant technology and some really fancy uh, hospitals, we also lag behind in many, many other ways. Yeah, so you, you talked about uh, 30 trillion in the whole, Medicare is 30 trillion in the whole, and, and I understand that uh, people tend to use about three times as much in Medicare than they put in. Good for you. But, for you. <laughs> you know, at, at the same time, you know, talking about uh, the debt owed to Medicare, and, and this comes up with Social Security all the time with the Republicans, is, it, you know, that, that's money that, that's being lent out in, in bond form, right? Like Social Security on the payroll runs uh, a tr trillions of dollars in surplus. 
Is, is that correct? Uh, no. Um, and forgive me, this is financial and, and business oriented. Um, let me start from the beginning. Um, the United States is run entirely on a cash basis. Meanwhile, any business in America with more than $5 million in annual revenue, which is basically larger than a single standalone McDonald's, has to use cash and accrual accounting. Accrual accounting is not cruel. It's accurate. <laughs> accrual accounting keeps up with your credit card. That's really important these days. If you only keep up with your cash and don't keep up with your credit card, you're really going to have a headache at the end of the month. Your nation has not been keeping up with the credit card, really, ever. So that's what's in trouble, all the stuff that's on the credit card. Now, what's on the credit card? Not only Medicare, but Social Security, Medicaid, much of the VA system. This is pretty scary. Now, I'm out of the mainstream on this issue. I'm more conservative than most any of my colleagues in the Democratic or Republican Party on this issue, because just in the last two months, votes in Congress, not my votes, but my colleagues, have made this overall problem $3 trillion worse. Because it's fun to do. Everybody wants a tax break. Everybody wants new spending. Do it. Well, we are not Santa Claus. Now, we don't want to be Scrooge either. But this compulsion of my colleagues to ask like Santa Claus is terrifying. Because there is a limit to how much money we are going to borrow. It used to be we paid for our own wars. We stopped doing that after 9-11. These are the first wars in United States history. Well, Vietnam we weren't keen on paying for either. LBJ fudged that budget. But where are the war bonds? Where is the patriotic effort to loan money to fight our own wars? So we borrowed that mainly from abroad. China, Japan, England, European nations. Well, how much money are they going to keep on lending us? And here you have to get your head in the game, because everybody has a rough theoretical understanding of trillion, but not really. You have to feel it in your stomach. So I explain it this way. What's a million seconds? 12 days. What's a billion seconds? 32 years. What's a trillion seconds? 32,000 years. And you're headed back toward dinosaur time. That's what I got yeah. in my, yeah. yeah. So this is stunning. So Albert Einstein said the most powerful force on Earth is not nuclear power. It's compound interest. And we've had unrealistically low interest rates for over a decade. Many in the younger generation take this as the new normal. It is not. Money is not free. And when interest rates return to normal, we are really hurting because our debt service will soon be bigger than our entire defense budget. And most of that money is going to be paid to foreigners. This does not make America stronger. If you understand finance, borrowing just allows you to accelerate gratification. And our country really doesn't need more instant gratification. We need more long-term investment to be stronger and better for the future. But see, that's not popular for my colleagues to hand out. So most of my colleagues will not even mention the words accrual accounting, and most of them don't know what it is anyway. But I'm terrified of this issue because Bloomberg Businessweek says that the real debt for America isn't 20 trillion. It's not even 60 to 80 trillion. They put it at 210 trillion dollars. And the technical term for this is not in the hole or something like that. It's called fiscal gap. Because our accounting techniques don't begin to look at this. For example, the most recent tax bill, which is popular in some quarters, made the business tax breaks permanent, but the individual tax breaks only last five years. And of course, if you terminate a tax break, that looks like a tax increase, even though you're returning to what we had before. But the reason they terminate after five years is you don't have to put the whole cost in the 10-year window, which is our normal budget projection. So we're in the ironic situation where our state legislature in Tennessee does a fiscal note on every bill, and we don't really do that in Washington. Because if it's fun, we just kind of sweep it under the rug. That is so wrong. And future generations are going to look back at us and said they were an advanced society. They had the tools to understand their situation. They could have measured it. And they chose not to. So I'm worried, very worried, we're in a, an interest rate bubble and a health care bubble. 
Because once we, gravity returns, <laughs> you start thinking about paying these bills. Just the simple statement that Ben said in his preamble. Of course, he knew that the average Medicare beneficiary will draw out three times more than they ever paid into it, plus interest. That right there, for an insurance scheme, means bankruptcy. And don't take my word for it. A former George W. Bush Treasury official named Peter Fisher said this in a speech, and he thought he'd get fired for it, but they couldn't fire him because he was telling the truth. He said, what is the federal government? It's basically a giant insurance company because 70% of all government spending goes for an actuarially based function. And the federal government's not just an insurance company, it's an insurance company with a standing army. But it's an insurance company that doesn't even use real accounting. And what's that? That's not even an insurance company. And these are the fatal words. He said, that's an accident waiting to happen. Well, I don't want my country to be an accident waiting to happen. I don't want to have to beg foreign lenders for money. And we need to ask ourselves in this room, how many of you have U.S. Treasury bonds in your portfolio? How many of you have your share of Treasury bonds in your portfolio? And most people would say, oh, that's too safe. That pays too low a rate of interest. We want something more exciting in our portfolio, which means you're not supporting your own government in these programs. So this is a much direr situation. And the common reaction I get is, Oh, Jim, be more cheerful, give us a happy ending. Well, that's what a child wants to hear with a bedtime story. I'm not here to read you a bedtime story because we're all adults in this room. Even the high school students are about to be adults. And if you want a happy ending to the story, you have to write it. You have to support policies. You have to vote for people. You have to run as candidates yourselves who will do the right Thing. And that's not pretending to be Santa Claus. That's being realistic, that's being accurate, that's being fair, and real with numbers. And so many folks in America just hate math and don't, you know, it's like, <laughs> you, they say with books, if you put one equation in a book, you cut the sales of the book in half. If you put two equations in, you cut the sales by two thirds. Well, we're a smart country. Why do we so <laughs> limit ourselves when other countries do not have this math aversion that we do. Sorry. Well, that's well, <laughs> no, that's great. I, I, a little I, preachy, too. Apologize about that. But no, I, I think you really. just yeah. discovered your next uh, campaign slogan. You know, I'm not here to read you a bedtime story. I think, <laughs> I think that's a pretty good one. Uh, well. All right, so my, my last question is uh, youth turnout. You know, mm -hmm. my generation, uh, lo w w some of the lowest uh, well, America has the worst turnout of just about any democracy. Uh, Tennessee knows that especially. I think we're 50th in, in voter turnout. Uh, I, I have the pleasure of being on the Mayor's Youth Council, and, and one of the best things that we do is uh, uh, registering kids to vote right as they turn 18. Uh, do you, what message would you give to my generation you know, to get involved in politics? or to? Well, this is a subject near and dear to my heart uh, with Republican State Senator Steve Dickerson. It's a totally bipartisan effort. We have launched Project Register here. Uh, we had on the MBA campus a state rep come by, John Ray Clements, to encourage MBA students. But we've gone to every high school in three counties, every high school in Davidson County, Cheatham, and Dixon, every high school public and private, because that's what state law has said since the 1970s, but nobody has enforced it because we want our new 18-year-olds to be registered to vote and to vote. Now, we did this two years ago. We increased high school voter registration by like 80%. Guess how many of those kids voted? 3%. This year, we have exceeded what we did two years ago. We've increased it by 85%. That's 2,500 new high school registrants. But if they end up unable to find their precinct or not sufficiently moved or not inspired or not able to vote by phone, you know, because almost everything else you do in your life is by phone, then we're not going to have your voice. And whether it's the parkland issue, whether it's any other issue you care about, we need all generations to be involved and you actually have the most to lose because you're going to be living here longer. But the way it works is all seniors vote 
and hardly any young people vote. Now, we even put together the pizza video. I don't know if any of y'all saw that shown here. Apparently, most young people like pineapple on their pizza. And most older people like mushroom on their pizza. And guess what? You're going to be eating mushroom pizza the rest of your life unless you start getting out and voting for pineapple. And I'm agnostic about pizza toppings. But why, if you like pineapple, don't you, you get your act together? No. It's ironic because, in general, uh, I had a, the guy who was first in my class at law school was an aerospace engineer, a genius, an amazing person. And he came to law school in his late 20s. I asked him why, and he said, well, he wanted to be in a profession where you peaked in your 50s and 60s, not in your teens and 20s, because he'd already done that, and he had quite a peak. Politics somehow appeals more to older people. They have more maturity, more experience, they're more familiar. I can't go anywhere with older people and not be recognized. I can go anywhere with young people and they have no freaking clue who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and not that I'm important. I'm a at-will employee you know, on a two-year contract. So um, I'm not a big deal, but I do have a special responsibility to try to guide the greatest nation in the history of the world so that we do not go senile, so that we not get too mature, so we do not rest on our laurels. And that is the greatest joy that anybody could have in employment. We are the envy of the world. And let's not screw this up. But we are coming dangerously close in so many ways because we don't even know our foundations anymore. You know, and maybe at school it's like MBA, civics is still taught, but it's lightly taught in most places. And most people are largely unfamiliar with our own constitution. So we've got to get real. We've got to have a winning strategy. You know, some people would tell you we haven't won a war since World War II. That's a long time. Now, that's a cynical view of it, but we've, we've got to do better in so many ways. And right now, we're not doing better. Is that sufficiently depressing? <laughs> Well, I, I'll, I'll take a stand right now against mushrooms on pizza. Well, I mean, yeah, so. uh, Congressman, I think uh, uh, I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, and I, and I want to say uh, sincerely that uh, I'm very proud to be represented by somebody uh, as intelligent as you and uh, with such strong conviction. I, I think I speak for everybody here. So uh, thank, thank you very, very much. Kind. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that.